Hey, how's it going, guys? So, with Rust Guns Rumble coming out next week, I uh, wanted to take a second to, you know, look back at the Boomstay metagame post Giggling Adventure nerf. And I wanted to do this because it'll be useful to have, like, a single video that you can always go back to when you're looking to see, like, what was strong at the time, uh, why those decks were strong, why decks, like, what decks in the meta had to do to survive. Um, it's also useful because a lot of the time, especially when metagames become more stale, so, you know, two, three months after cards come out, um, the meta's kind of settled down. It's interesting to go back and look at previous metas to see what decks existed then, to see what might be able to be reimagined into new decks. Um, and then also to, you know, give some pre Rustcon Rumble videos some context, because we have a couple videos coming out, um, which are obviously pre Rustcons. And so what you're seeing in those videos are going to be a different meta, um, than what you're going to be playing against. And so being able to look back at this before you go look at those to um, see like what's being played around, um, what kind of things were strong, kind of give just a little bit more of an idea of like the mindset going into those videos can be kind of useful. Because a lot of the time if you go back to older content, it um, is just ob like obviously less relevant. But if you have this kind of video to go back and look at beforehand, then you can kind of get a lot more out of those pre rust cons videos. And so um, I essentially just wanted to start by looking at what the post healing adventure nerf brought to the table in terms of the metagame. Um, according to Vicious Syndicate, the tier 1 decks are currently Even Shaman, Odd Paladin, Death Rattle Hunter, Even Paladin, Even Warlock, and Secret Hunter. And so if we go into here, I've got some of these lists pulled up. These are all off of the Vicious Syndicate. Um, data reaper report or whatever it's called i think it was number 131 and so the first one they mentioned is even shaman so we're going to go in and look at the list that they have for that um i actually did two videos on even shaman which you can see you know come out um pre rust cons which kind of use this list as a base the corpse taker package is definitely like very very strong in this deck i would suggest that if you were running even Shaman at the time, um, to be using this Corpse Sacred Package. In the post Giggling Inventor metagame, the Corpse Sacred Package actually popped up in multiple classes, and it's just really strong. It turns out to have a 4 mana 3-3 three, three with Taunt, Divine Shield, Lifesteal, Wind Fury, because if you can get all those keywords on there, that is just a ton of power in one single card. Um, but so we're going to go look into lists more individually later, but so this is the Even Shaman they're talking about. They also brought up Odd Paladin. So this is Light Burns Odd Paladin from the Vicious Syndicate list. Um, again, we're going to go through these more in depth later, but I just want to kind of put them up on the screen while we talk about it. Death Rattle Hunter, we have down here. This is the standard Death Rattle Hunter list. Uh, Even Paladin has seen a resurgence recently. This is kind of a weird list that they had on the Vicious Syndicate report. Um, this list, in my opinion, is not really what you're going for with Even Paladin. Um, it has a lot of interesting choices, which I would swap out, but again, we're going to go through lists more in depth later. Um, Even Warlock is down here. So this is the standard Even Warlock list. Again, have a lot to critique about this, but we'll go through that later. And then their final tier 1 deck was Secret Hunter, which is all the way up here. So these are the lists that you're looking at as tier one metagame lists. Um, essentially the point of tier one is that if you are trying to grind for like legend or you don't know what to bring to a tournament, tier one is gonna have the strongest um, overall power level in their deck, as well as typically like they're able to beat other tier one and tier two decks. The reason that you're tier one is because you're able to consistently have good matchups versus other tier one decks. And so if you were trying to pull for like a top four finish in a tournament or trying to hit legend these are the decks that you'd be experiencing a lot tier two is where it gets into very competitive decks typically tier two is filled with decks that were originally in tier one and then kind of fell out of favor for whatever reason or um things rose to tier one that beat them so much that they kind of fall out of relevancy and so according to this, tier 2 included Odd Rogue, Cube Warlock, Big Spell Mage, Togweggle Druid, Malagos Druid, Death Rattle Rogue, and then Zoo Warlock. Um, 
their tier one is pretty indicative of the overall meta, I would say. Those decks that we just went through. Um, the only deck that I disagree with is Even Shaman. I don't believe that Even Shaman was anywhere near tier one for more than about a week or two in the Boomsday meta. Um, we have two videos up discussing Even Shaman, so there will be links around here somewhere in the video or in the description box below. Um, it seemed mostly underwhelming. Like, you can pull out wins sometimes, but especially especially if you're bring, going into a tournament meta, um, even Shaman seems extremely weak. Um, with the resurgence of Token Druid and then Spreading Plague just being a common card in all Druid lists, um, and then Cube Hunter is just a deck, all of those, because of Token Druid, Spreading Plague, and then Cube Hunter just naturally running it, Mossy Horrors in the meta, and even Shaman just gets destroyed by Mossy Horror, which is a tech card that's already being run for other decks, and also other decks are running it as just part of their game plan. And so, typically, if you're a deck that's getting beaten by cards that are just naturally in lists, um, you're going to be a little bit weaker. If people had to tech around you with Mossy Horror, so originally when Giggling Adventure was 5, that's when Mossy Horror really came to came to fruition as like the best tech card in the game because it turns out if every deck's running boss or running five mana giggling inventor turn six mossy horror kills all of it and that's really good but with the giggling inventor nerf you would have expected to see mossy horror go away but with spreading plague tokens uh odd paladin still being a deck um token druid it crushes token druid too so even with it resurging i don't think token druid was near tier two or tier three um but having Mossy Horror around in the meta just in decks, especially in Cube Hunter, which is a tier 1 deck, um, even Shaman should not be placed here, I don't believe, because it just gets completely destroyed by tech cards that are already being run. Um, Odd Rogue has also fallen out of favor. It used to be considered like the best deck in the game, best aggro deck, tier 1. Um, it's still tier 2, according to this most recent thing. This video is being recorded on the 26th, so we have about a week before um, Rescon's Rumble comes out, so this will probably be the last Vicious Syndicate report to come out. Um, even though Odd Rogue is supposedly tier 2, it's still a deck you run into a ton on ladder, and it's still definitely a tournament presence deck, and it can outvalue even Shaman by a mile just with its hero power and with SS7 agent, because it can clear off totems so well. Um, and then Odd Paladin being a tier 1 deck, I've always felt that even Shaman into Odd Paladin is like a 40-60 matchup. You're really probably not favored in that, especially depending on your list. Lots of lists in even Shaman were starting to tech out the Hagatha, which is one of the biggest board clears you have against a level up board. And so, um, especially with that tech going away from the Odd Paladin matchup, you definitely lose that. So, even Shaman really, I do not believe, should be in tier 1. Um, it's interesting to see that it was kind of placed in there. If you go and look at the Vicious Syndicate report, um, it's you know it's important to keep in mind that these stats could be skewed by lower ranked data, as well as the even Shaman meta score that they give it. It's like a 67. That's pretty pretty bad. Um, that kind of comes back to what we were talking about about how why why it may have been weak. But apparently they believe that its overall power level is still just enough to make it into tier one, even with its meta score being pretty poor. Um, I don't think that's right, but I think that that point's kind of been pushed a lot. So we'll move on. Um, the rest of tier one seems correct to me. Even Paladin is in their tier one, and even with its resurgence, it's definitely a weaker deck than what it used to have called Arms. Um, it goes in a different, you know, style. It's kind of more mid-rangey, more grindy than the old even Paladin was when it was able to just push lots of aggro with Call to Arms. But um, I don't believe that it's quite into Tier 1 yet. It's an interesting deck. There's a lot of different variations on it, especially considering the list they used. I don't believe to be a, um, particularly strong. That's kind of probably why part of the reason I think it's in Tier 2. But um, I don't believe that it's proven itself as a tier 1 deck yet. I would personally replace even Paladin in, in their tier 1 um, with Malaga's Druid, because I think that at the at the moment, combo Druid of any kind, so like there's Malaga's Druid, Togwiggle Druid, even Mechathun Druid, and then to a lesser extent Taunt Druid, they're all basically like tier 1 strongest deck in the game aside. Like, it's competing with Seeger Hunter and... Um, 
I guess, Odd Rogue in my opinion, even though Odd Rogue's kind of fallen off as like top tier deck, best deck in the game. So it was really surprising to me to see that no Druid deck was actually placed into their tier one, because Combo Druid has been the defining deck of the entirety of the Doomsday meta. Um, but say la vie. Tier 2 is also filled with decks that I would have expected, so Odd Rogue's there, Q Block is there, it's started to see an uptick in popularity, mostly because um, Even Warlock is tier 1, but it has some interesting matchups versus aggro decks, and so Q Block is supposed to help aid those um, aggro matchups, as well as it gives the Doom Guard cube combos for against um, like Shutterwalk Shaman, Odd Warrior, and any Druid deck, so you try and get some burst out of that. Um, so it gives an interesting win condition against both aggro and control. And so I definitely believe that, uh, that Q block should be in there. Um, and then Death Rattle Rogue is the only other notable tier 2 deck that I saw. Um, I actually pulled up a Death Rattle Rogue list right here that we can look at really quick. Um, in the past, they weren't running the Corpse Seeker package, but like I said in the post Giggling Inventor nerf metagame, Corpse Taker has come out as like a very strong deck, or a very strong card, that can be placed into a lot of decks, along with Zilliax, because Zilliax is like the best, it's in aggro, combo, control, it's in every deck right now. Zilliax is incredibly strong, and it synergizes incredibly well with Corpse Taker, and so even though you have to make some weird changes to your deck, so like running this one Argent Squire, and running this Storm Watcher, um, it's very worthwhile, especially considering these cards on their own aren't awful, they're just a little bit below the power curve, but old tempo, like Keliseth Rogue in the past ran Stormwatcher with Cold Bloods, so it's definitely like not just there to enable your Corpse Takers. Um, but with that, you know, Death Rattle Rogue's been sitting on the sidelines, it's hit Legend, Top 1 Legend, I think, like multiple times by certain players. Um, it's a deck that's always kind of been around in the Boomsday meta, but I think it's finally found its home with this Corpse Saker package, and so it's definitely like the most solid tier 2 deck that they listed. Um, the only other decks that were in lower tiers, like so tier 3, tier 4, that I really wanted to mention, were Shutterwalk Shaman and Odd Warrior. So let's start with Shutterwalk Shaman. It's, um, it's interesting that even with other combo decks running around that are typically regarded as stronger, so, you know, Malaga Druid, Tagpogo Druid, Megathun Druid, Iffy on Mechathun Priest, that's a deck that started to come out too, which admittedly I believe is like much stronger than Shutterwalk Shaman. Um, with with all those combo decks running around and strong aggro lists, which include uh, Odd Rogue, Odd Paladin, I guess I'll give it to Even Shaman. I don't think it's super strong, but it does, it's still present. And then, even though it's not an aggro deck, I would put um, the Death Rattle Hunter into this conversation against Shutterwalk Shaman. All those decks, along with all the combo decks, makes for a really interesting metagame for Shutterwalk Shaman, because just like based on the eye test, there's a lot of different things going on, which Shutterwalk Shaman should, you know, in theory, have a bad matchup against something. And it's it's really interesting that even though it has all these different matchups that going on in the meta, it's still like supposedly strong enough to like see play and especially in tournaments where you get a ban and you can make your lineup all around it it's still a very very present archetype which is interesting because it's like the slowest combo deck that's out there right now all the druid combo decks are faster because they have incredible card draw um all the druid combo decks have armor gain which is essentially the same as healing rain which is just better because you aren't capped at 30 so it's really weird to see the shutterwalk shaman is still a list that's around um I think that the current incarnation is, you know, decently strong. It's a good tournament pick. For um, ladder, I would not suggest it, but, you know, say la vie again. Um, it's interesting to see that Shutterwalk Shaman kind of survived through all of this. Even though it's a little bit further down, it's definitely a deck which is very, like, it's always there. You always have to have it in the back of your mind when you're making control decks. Like, can I beat Shutterwalk Shaman if I queue into this? And especially with Rust Contrumal coming out, um, every every class has different directions to go now, but I think that Shutterwalk Shaman is still going to be a deck which can only improve, because again, with with Rust Guns coming out, nothing actually rotates, and so it still has the same core cards, but it might just be able to get a few, you know, tech slots in here and there that just make it over the top. So I would say Shutterwalk Shaman right now in the Boomsday meta was 
kind of underwhelming, but it was still always kind of there. Um, but going forward, it's a very scary archetype, and it's definitely something to look at with every Battlecry minion that comes out. Um, the last deck I want to talk about that was in Tier 3 is Odd Warrior. Uh, we have a standard Odd Warrior here. Some of them also run more taunts and the quest to give more of a win condition versus control. The standard Odd Warrior list instead runs Azelina to you know, try and steal resources and combos from the opposing deck. Um, Odd Warrior, I don't really have a lot to say about. I just kind of want to mention for the fact that we're going through the meta that it was there. Um, I never thought Odd Warrior was a very strong deck. I don't believe this list is very strong. Um, it's the most polarized deck in the game, so like if you're going against lots of aggro, then cool, you have like a 70% win rate versus Odd Rogue, Odd Paladin, even Shaman, stuff like that. But um, I'm mainly a combo control player, so I played lots of Druid. Turns out Odd Warrior has no game versus Druid, so you just kind of lose, you have like a 20% win rate. Um, but with the introduction of Gen and Baku, Odd Warrior became a deck. Um, yeah, I just kind of mention, mention it exists for the purposes of like, hey, this was in the meta. Um, but I don't believe it was ever super strong. It really wasn't even a tournament choice unless you were going a full control lineup. But at this point, like, your full control lineup would have included like Odd Warrior, a Druid archetype, maybe like a Shutterwalk Shaman, and then like a Big Spell Mage. And that means that you're bringing Shutterwalk Shaman and Big Spell Mage to a tournament, which, you know, I don't believe are the best choices you could have made. So yeah, Odd Warrior existed too. Um, with that, that was kind of a quick look into all the meta decks that kind of were around at the time. Um, I have all these lists here, so I kind of want to go in depth into some of the lists, explain what I would have done different with some of these like standard lists that the Vicious Syndicate gives you. Um, and I kind of want to explain what in this meta you kind of had to deal with as a deck to make you strong. And so before we go into actual lists, I just want to point out that like in this meta, the biggest cards that you had to worry about when you were making a deck is how do you deal with Hench Clan Thug being a 4-4 four, four on turn 3? Is there a way for your deck to deal with 5-5 five, five Devil Swords from Death Rattle Hunter? Um, is there a way for your deck to efficiently remove Corpse Takers? And then is there also a way that your deck can like at least semi-viably control the token spam of both um, Odd Paladin and Even Shaman? And so... For control, a lot of that came down to just having board clears, having early board clears. Um, with stuff like even lock, you could run spirit bomb to kill the four four hench clan thug. Um, so for control decks, it wasn't as interesting a question to pose. But especially for other aggro decks, if you're going against a turn four hench clan thug, what do you do to deal with that? If you're going against a devil sore egg that gets a three three that makes a five five. Is there any way that your deck can kind of like try and pull through that or is that just too much for you to handle and so with that in mind let's go through some of these lists so secret hunter was in the tier one um secret hunter is kind of an outlier from the point that i just made because it acts it's a very very like non-standard way of playing a deck because essentially you run all these kind of shitty cards so you run all the secrets so that you can get subject nine value and secrets in the early game are okay. They're supplemented insanely by the Spellstone. Like, this deck would not exist if you didn't have Spellstone. This deck existed in the past um, in more of a mid-range hunter focus, but it turns out that all the supporting cards were mid-range hunters, so like running um, like Animal Companions and Houndmasters and stuff like that, just a little bit under the curve, running tons of secrets into... Spellstone is extremely, extremely strong. And then you have supporting cards for that. So you have an early game drop, an early game drop that gets buffed. This is good because you make tons of five or tons of three threes with your five drop. So you can try and eke some value out of that. You can also, if you get the chance against a control deck, you can go like turn one Dire Mole into turn two Crackling and have a really strong board. Um, tracking is like the MVP of this deck because your deck has a ton of awful draws. And being able to kind of cycle those out into the important cards is really good because Deathstalker Rexar in any control matchup gives you game because Build a Beast is just so strong. You can just go for the highest value beast every turn and eventually you'll probably run out your control deck of resources. Um, so the reason this deck was able to sustain in the meta, especially at tier one, 
is you have some early game, so you can try and survive versus um, like odd rogue, odd uh, paladin, and even shaman. You have some secrets that help with board flood, so this is good versus you know any of those tokeny decks that we were talking about. This is good versus control decks. This is good versus tokeny decks because they'll try and value trade to um, improve their board position, and then you just get some one ones to trade in. Venom Strike. It's an interesting card because lots of people for a long time didn't see any value in it, but it turns out that both in control and in <laughs> aggro matchups, just getting a free 2-3 with poison this is pretty good. So lots of this is predicated on the fact that you're going to go against lots of like value trading decks, and so your secrets kind of reflect that and help you build your board state while they try and value trade. Um, and then, you know, Explosive Trap for the last resort, clear, stuff like that. And against any aggro deck, making four three threes on turn five is almost insurmountable. Essentially, this card has like an 80% played win rate if you play it on five, because it's almost impossible for an aggro deck to deal with. And then for the control matchups, you have Rexar, and that's really all you need. So that's why this deck was in here. I have nothing to change with this deck. This is like the best configuration of cards for this archetype I've seen. Bear Shark's interesting. Um, it's definitely really good versus control, but you already kind of have a controlling winning card here, so I think you probably could cut bear sharks and try to find more anti-aggro tools, but that's really the only thing I would change in this list. Getting a second flanking strike in here would probably be pretty good too, because flanking strike's really strong. But So that's why that deck was in tier 1. Odd Rogue, for the majority of the Boomsday, was in tier 1, um, but post Giggling nerf, it kind of fell off a little bit because of the resurgence of Death Rattle Hunter after Giggling was nerfed, because it turns out that Death Rattle Hunter did not have a good answer to a turn 5 Giggling, because they made 5-5s, five which get blocked by 1-2s with the Divine Shields. But with Giggling completely nuked and out of the metagame, um, that deck grows to power, and this deck doesn't have a super good answer versus Death Rattle Hunter. Um, but it's just your you know standard aggro deck. You play some early crap, you buff your weapon, you use your weapon to value trade, and you just win through, like, pure aggression, pure board control. So, you kill all their minions with your dagger, and or you kill all their minions with your dagger, and then you just hit face with everything else, and eventually you win the game. Um, this is a card that I want to talk about really quick, Myra's. Myra's wasn't initially in lots of these lists, but as combo decks started to become more prevalent, um, you could easily run out of steam with Odd Rogue, and so even though you put yourself into fatigue, five mana on a somewhat dead turn to draw ten cards is incredibly powerful. With that in mind, there was an Odd Rogue deck that popped up, which definitely like focused upon that. So it ran Myra's, and then it ran Arcane Tyrant, so that when you had that dead turn where you had to Myra's, you could at least have the chance to get some free 4-4s. Four um, this deck, I'm not sure how it fared against like typical odd rogue but i don't play a lot of odd rogue but i played a lot of this deck because it seemed really interesting and this tech of the arcane tyrants with the myras and then the assassinates to give some extra value to these seemed really really strong so i think that going forward into rastacons um if typical odd rogue doesn't work trying to find a way to get more tempo plays out of myras is the way to make that deck kind of pop back up into the meta um so yeah, Odd Rogue was really good, um, just because it could control with the dagger. Um, that's really all you have to know about Odd Rogue. Death Rattle Rogue. This is a strictly tier 2 deck. Um, it has pretty weak matchups. It's very draw dependent. But um, if you're able to survive the first couple turns, then you have like a pretty strong core with cubes and mechanical whelps and just making big boards. Um, I would say out of almost all the decks that we're going to go through today, um, Death Rattle Rogue is the one that I don't think has as much staying power through Rastacons, because it, it kind of, its early game is really iffy, it's kind of like really draw dependent, um, and its late game just kind of makes lots of big threats, and while that's cool, there's lots of cards which deal with big threats, so like, Blizzard can freeze your entire board and you can't do anything. Vanish just pops all your stuff back. You've lost so much progress. Um, I think that the use of Necrium Vial is really cool, and that's the thing to pull away from this deck, is that Necrium Vial is actually like a very strong card. If there's a way to 
get more immediate value out of it. Because a lot of the time, what you did is you would cube like a mechanical whelp or cube a seven seven from the mechanical whelp and just get a big board. And like that's strong, but I don't think, especially with all the new cards coming out and lots of the new cards are going to be very powerful. I don't think just creating a big board on like turn seven or eight is going to be good enough. Um, but this deck existed. That was kind of cool. The Corpse Saker package. This is probably one of the best decks to showcase how Corpse Saker was strong because it really took like almost no effort to like really pump it up because you already had Zilliax and so you just put this in for consistency and as a one drop to help your early game and this is just purely there for Wind Fury but is good versus control decks so very interesting list um, obviously players who have played a lot hit legend with it um, I've tinkered with it it seems okay um, I definitely would have had to put more time into learning it but it seems not awful so that's why it was in tier two um quest rogue is a deck that's always been you know in and out of the meta it doesn't really shine right now because there's a lot of aggro decks going around but it's kind of always just there um quest rogue going forward is a deck that you always have to worry about because if your deck can survive two or three nerfs then it's pretty much ever it's always going to be ever present um right now in this meta there's just a little bit too much aggro going on and like it takes you, I don't know, six, seven turns to complete your combo if you're like, if you have a really good draw. And by turn six or seven, if you're against a druid combo deck, they're already, they've already been on ten mana. They're already like pushing through their deck insanely quickly, and so it's just kind of not as strong as other combo decks right now. Getting into Odd Paladin, um, this brings up something which, once we go through all the lists, I have a point about Baku and Gen that I want to talk about but we'll save that for a little bit later. Um, Odd Paladin has been one of the strongest decks since even Paladin with Cold Arms got nerfed. Um, it turns out making a 2-2 on turn 2 for free every turn with your hero power is really, really strong because you don't actually have to use any cards to commit to the board. And obviously your opponent has to deal with your 1-1s, one so they have to commit cards onto the board, and then you get... In, like infinite value with your um, with your hero power, and then your deck is basically built around like making your infinite value generator of your hero power like synergistic. So you have level up, which is one of the strongest cards ever printed, especially the fact that it's going to be in standard with Baku for the entirety of its lifespan. Um, that combo is never going away. I don't. I don't expect to see Odd Paladin ever disappear from a meta, purely because um, the infinite value it generates with its hero power means that like, you can just make such an incredible push for the board. And then you have this synergistic card, which is never going away. You have this card, which is in Kobold, but that doesn't rotate for another, like I don't know, six months. So that's really strong. And then this is like Burns Odd Paladin. It was the list that Vicious Syndicate used. It runs one of these guys which helps because for a long time um, there was what's it called D Despicable Dreadlord in Warlock lists which cleared all your 1-1s. One this also helps because if you buff your Silver Hands and then buff them up with level up they're at 4 health instead of 3 which is a big point against Duskbreaker um, which was a card that Priest was running for a while so Boisterous Bard is pretty cool it also helps in aggro matchups because you just get better value trades so yeah, Odd Paladin, really strong. Even Paladin's a list which um, its entire build has changed incredibly over the entirety of the Boomsday meta, because originally it had called arms at 4 mana instead of 5, and so when that got nerfed, it disappeared for a long time, but it started to come back for whatever reason. Um, it's kind of hard to tell why it came back. I think someone probably just one day decided, hey, I want to play Even Paladin. Let's see how that goes. And it ended up working out really well for him. Um, Even Paladin was the first deck to really make Corpse Taker like a card that existed. Because it existed in Even Shaman, but um, it wasn't really like a standout card. Corpse Taker in Even Paladin is one of the like primary win conditions against a control deck. Because if you can land this with Wind Fury and then blessing it kings it up that's a lot of pressure that you can put on um that that's basically like 
you have all these early game tools to help survive versus aggro. You have pyro quality, which is good. Even against like Odd Paladin, just going pyro into a spell gets the one damage AoE, and that's really powerful. Um, and then for late game control, you have Valonir, Lich King, Tyrion, um, and then Corpse Takers are really scary. Sunkeeper can always be scary because you get the one mana, one ones. So this deck is really interesting. It's like the closest thing to a mid range deck that we have in the meta. Um, and especially with the inclusion of Valonir, it's very like it can grind you out even if you think that you've had the the game one for like three four five turns a valonir just getting multiple recursion buffs is incredible and so the list that they have on vicious syndicate i don't agree with very much like i understand why bone mare's in there i don't believe bone mare is the strongest card so i would pull these out or at least one of um there's a decent amount of like silence and transform removal and so while spike ridge is really good um, I don't believe that you need two of, so I normally cut that. Um, I haven't experimented a lot with the Glass Knight, but whenever I play it, it just kind of feels weak. I don't really restore health enough to get the Divine Shield back over and over again, so I kind of get rid of him. Um, and then I was experimenting with this card, because just it seemed fun. This card is actually surprisingly strong in those grinding control matchups, because if you're able to buff things up and then also buff it with Valonir, especially with Wind Fury or with your Corpse Takers, it becomes a big threat. It also makes your Serenites a much larger threat, especially if you get a recursion buff on Valonir with it. So, like, I like running this card. Um, and then there's just, you know, there's a lot of different places you can go. I kind of liked running the Hydrologist. Just throw that in there, because Secrets can be really strong. But, um... There's a little bit of wiggle room with even Paladin. It's definitely interesting, but it's like the definitive mid-range deck right now, aside from Death Rattle Hunter. Uh, even Shaman. This list I think is pretty like awful, but um, even Shaman has been in the in and out of the meta too. It's an aggro deck. It's like a tokeny deck, but there's I don't really see a whole lot of reason to run even Shaman over Odd Paladin or Odd Rogue. Um, you get a little bit more late game out of it, and you get Sea Giants, which can be a big threat, but essentially, like, Odd Paladin kind of does what you're doing with the token synergy, but better. Um, also, like, we did two videos on Even Shaman, so you can go back and look at those. Um, this is not what I believe the best list to be, especially if you're going into Ladder, where you're going to be seeing a decent amount of Odd Rogue. You have three two mana two twos which all die to a hero power for free um this is not not the best list for ladder i don't believe but corpse taker was shown in there corpse taker again really strong card so it makes sense why even shaman was kind of in and out of the meta also hagatha being an infinite value generator can be useful um it can pull games that you shouldn't win and that's always good to have cards that do that in your deck the only real priest deck that existed in the post Boomsday meta, um, Mechathune Priest was kind of a deck. It's at the very end of Boomsday, it's been seeing a resurgence, but for a long time it was just a meme deck. Um, Asmodai's Resurrect Priest has been around for a couple weeks now, and it has staying power. It hasn't left the meta. Lots of high legend players are playing it at like top 100, top 500, and it has a lot of game. This list. I don't believe is the original Asmodai Priest list. This is the one off Vicious Syndicate. Um, it runs a Witchwood Grizzly to help kind of supplement your early game. Um, but essentially just having a deck where on turn 9 or any turn past 9 you can threaten lethal is really strong. Lots of players started cutting Shadow Essence. I don't believe that that's correct. I think Shadow Essence is like really strong for your deck. Because you're, you're trying to survive early, which is already kind of hard. And then you throw in one Witchwood, which is cool. But then, if you don't have the Shadow Essence in there, I don't know what you put in as early game supplement, because that's really all that you'd be looking for, is something to try and make your early game a little better. But getting a 5-5 five, five of, like, a Ziliax, even just a Taunter, or, like, a big, like, an Obsidian Statue, that can just win you the game on the spot. So I think that this list is incredibly powerful. Um, 
lists similar to this, I think, will stay throughout the meta unless it becomes incredibly aggro centric. Because like right now, even though the meta has a lot of aggro decks in it, lots of them are kind of tokeny based, which makes Spirit Lash like the best board clear versus them. Especially if you get like Velen or Malagos to get all your life back. Um, if it turns more into like a old Keliseth Tempo Rogue meta or um, like a Zoo Warlock meta where they don't have as many tokens, they have things with like higher health so they can value trade, this deck probably gets considerably worse. Um, but if there's any sort of control meta, this deck is just going to dominate because turn 9 plus you can just threaten lethal with the Xerix Cloning Gallery, which you can also get earlier with Shadow Visions. So that's a really strong deck. Mage does not really have a place in the metagame right now. Um, there's Big Spell Mage, which, you know, you see occasionally. I really like Big Spell Mage, but it's very, very bad versus combo decks. And so, essentially, because all the Druid combos existed, and Shutterbox Shaman's still kind of there, um, it got pushed out of the meta because of all the combo decks. So the most popular <laughs> Murloc deck is Murloc Mage. Um, it's... It's a Murloc deck. You just kind of smork them really fast. And Megasaur on 4, back in Angoro, was like the best thing for Murloc Paladin. Turns out Megasaur on 4 in any metagame where you have some Murlocs on board is really good. And then a Luna to try and draw into your burn. Stargazer Luna to help draw. Book of Spectres is an interesting card, which um, wasn't run for a long time. And it finally kind of find a, found a home in this deck. So Murloc Mage is your standard, like aggro deck. It has very little trading happening. You hit face a lot, and you just try and burn them out. It's definitely a game plan. It's not my favorite game plan, but I can see why players like it. Um, Maligos Druid. Combo Druid is the strongest archetype in the game at the moment, because it turns out, let's look, we can actually just look at this list. So here's this Maligos list. It's pretty standard. Um, there's not a lot I would change from it. But let's see. What what cards, if you're not playing Maligos, do you not need in Druid? So if you're just playing any Druid deck, what do you run? Well, you don't need these cause, unless you're Maligos. This is meh. Uh, these are all really good. You may, may or may not need Twig, but I'll keep it in there. And get rid of Alex Shreza and Maligos. And then let's just get rid of these two. But look, here are 23 cards. Maybe not Arcane Tyrant. Here's 21 cards that in almost any Druid deck you're going to run. That means that you can kind of do any any combo that you want, because these 21 cards are all powerful enough to see play just by themselves. Um, you have incredible ramp, you have incredible card draw, you have like the best um, value generating like survival um, death knight that was in the game. You get Spreading Plague for aggro, and you just have all this draw and armor gain. So Druid is the most powerful class in the game. I don't know how Vicious Syndicate did not rank it as tier 1, but it is the strongest class in the game right now. Alright, so we had a little bit of an interruption there, but that's alright. Um, last time we left off, we were talking about Even Warlock. Um, this list that the Vicious Syndicate had, um, I don't believe is the strongest list. It has, it's missing like some key elements of why you want to play even Warlock in this meta, notably Demonic Project, because it's the only form of uh, like in-hand combo deck removal in the game, so like you really want one or two of these, and then you can also consider running Gnome Feratu, just because like Plated Beetle and Gnome Feratu kind of serve the same purpose against aggro, they're both an early drop. Obviously you miss out on the armor, which can help with survivability, but I think that having the Gnome Feratu um, removal is really important versus the combo decks, so I'd probably put those in there and the Demonic Projects in there. Um, typically the list I run doesn't run a Dread Infernal, uh, because I just I used it to cut for slots like these, but um, it means that your Blood, Blood Reaver Gul'dan is pretty like weak. So you just get some 4-4s four and some 2-4s. So I'm, I'm definitely open to trying to fit in some bigger demons. Um, if we look at demons, I think that Dread Infernal is like the largest even mana one that you can run. Yeah, it is. So that's why that's in there. Uh, makes your Gul'dan's pretty good. The rest of this list is pretty strong. 
I'm not sure exactly what I'd cut, but I'd probably do like Beetle Beetle for like Demonic Project and um, Gnome Frat 2. And that's pretty standard. Even Warlock's really strong because you get turn 3 8 eights, or turn 4 8 eights against control decks. And against Aggro, you have Defile, Holy Vermiculus, Hellfire, and then 4 mana 7 7 taunts. And then also a Mossy Horror in there. It's really good. This is like your go to combo deck destroyer, i.e., to just completely win versus war or uh, druid because you have geist it gets rid of naturalizes and spell stones if you're against the togwaggle version those naturalizes are really important um even when you're against other versions getting rid of the naturalizes lets you put on pressure uh and then you would typically have the combo disruption tools that we were talking about so like demonic project so yeah so even warlock top tier like s tier is like even warlock any kind of druid mid-range hunter essentially Almost done with our little intro to the meta decks. Standard Death Riddle Hunter, um, this just has insane pressure, because turns out Katharina is like one of the best cards in the game. Um, typically these lists run a Charger Devil Soar as well. The Vicious Syndicate list does not run it. I think it cuts it for a Defender of Argus, which, you know, helps with the early game, but typically I think that your early game is fine, because you're going to have Witchwood Grizzlies, Zilliax, Rexar, and then your early game is already fairly, fairly strong. Because you have Candleshot to help deal with little threats, you have Keleseth, you get the 5-5s five from the eggs, you have an MC tech in there. So I think typically I would put in a little bit more late game with um, probably removing this Defender of Argus and putting in another big beast. But Death Row Hunter is insanely strong because you get free 5-5s five or free cubes on like chargers or free big ass taunts. Um, some lists at the beginning were running Void Ripper because you get a ton of Grizzlies and then you Void Ripper them to kill that way. I think that that's still definitely viable, especially because it helps with your Devil Sword Egg still. Um, just popping those. So that seems strong. Also, Mossy Horror is typical in these lists. I don't know why this list doesn't run one. Um, it's already good versus the meta because you get to kill Spreading Plague Tokens, Token Druid, even Shaman, not Paladin. Um, but it also pops your eggs, so Mossy Horror should definitely be in this deck. But Death Row Hunter is like one of the strongest decks in the game. And you also have Rexar for infinite uh, generation. And then the last deck I want to talk about is um, Odd Warrior. We talked a little bit about Odd Warrior at the beginning, but um, it's, it's a really weird deck. Um, Right after we get through these little this little deck section, I have an entire section on Baku and Gen and how that kind of changed the meta and how it's going to shape the game for a while. But um, one of the big culprits of that is Odd Warrior. So this list looks fairly typical. Um, a lot of lists will put in the quest and then some extra taunt minions so that they have a bit of a better win condition versus um, control decks because right now, like. You attempt to survive with tons of armor, and then you can Azalina threats away like from their hand. But I don't know. I don't have a ton of experience with this list because I prefer the taunt list. Um, but Azalina seems very sketchy because it's there to try and help your combo matchup because you can try and steal their combo before they combo you. But if they have all of their combo pieces, then they should have already comboed you, you know, instead of um, you being able to steal it and then do it. So, seems a little bit sketchy, um, and it's definitely, this is why it's in tier 3, because it's matchup versus anything control or combo is fairly lackluster. But against aggro, you have like a 70% win rate, so Odd Warrior was pretty good. So yeah, that's kind of an intro to a bunch of the decks that we saw in the Boomsday meta post Giggly Inventor nerf, and a little bit kind of a look into some of the stuff you could tech in and out. Um, why certain decks were really strong and prevalent, stuff like that. Um, this meta is really interesting in a lot of aspects, mostly because of the introduction of Baku and Gen. Um, the way that these two cards can like make you approach deck building and change how your game plan works to get to victory is really, really interesting. Ever since Baku and Gen came into the game with the Witchwood, um, HP manipulation has become a lot more prevalent within classes because it used to typically just be a warlock and like a warrior mechanic to um, like tap and that uses HP so you have to use that as a resource 
and then armoring up and using stuff like Battle Rage relied on um, how much HP you had versus armor, and especially now with like Reckless Flurry that takes into consideration your armor, stuff like that. So HP manipulation in those two classes still exists, but um, with the release and refinement of Baku and Gen lists, it also has become a staple in Odd Rogue because it uses its health and its hero power as a resource to try and push for board advantage. Um, even Warlock still obviously uses that because it has all the cards that synergize with self damage, so like the Spellstones, Blood Witch, Hooked Reaver, stuff like that. And then Odd Warrior now has access to board clears like Reckless Fury, which um, benefit from maintaining your armor at interesting totals. Because typically, old style control warrior lists would just armor up every turn and try to survive through fatigue and stuff like that. Um, but fatigue has kind of become like the lost archetype. It's kind of been phased out with a lot of um, different decisions that the team has made, which, you know, isn't a bad thing overall. Um, Dead Man's Hand is still there, so you can still make a viable fatigue um, warrior deck. And with Rust Guns Rumble, we get the chance for Fatigue Paladin with the 2-mana 1-3 that Death Rattle goes into your deck. Uh, King's Wayne still exists, so there's still ways to like kind of play a Fatigue matchup. Um, but because of the way that these lists have been refined, especially in Odd Warrior, a lot of the time it's not always best to just purely armor up, because if you're ever setting up, like if you're at like 10 health, obviously you want to armor to get the extra survivability, but you also have to take into consideration that eventually your armor might have to be used to board clear with with Reckless Flurry, and so you don't want to just completely stack armor because then you might lose too much of your survivability, so it's important to keep cards back like Shield Block and if you run it like Iron Hide and stuff like that, um, where typically old cell control lists would just run those out. So that's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, the mana that you would typically use to just gain all that armor could be used in different ways to, you know, extend your own board or develop extra threats, put extra cards in your deck, and Goro, Pax, um, Dead Man Tan, stuff like that. Um, combo decks, specifically in Druid, are as strong as they've ever been, because Druid has that insane core that we looked at while we were looking at deck lists. Um, there's really no lost matchup for Druid in the post Boomsday meta, because they have Spreading Plague for aggro, as well as Branching Pass, which they can use for armor or card draw, Ferocious Hell for armor, Malfury and the Pestial, which both gives you Taunt means to stall, and then pressure with the plus three damage every turn or stall with the plus three armor um in this meta and the previous meta in witchwood um ramp has really found its home ramp's always kind of been a druid mechanic which i've always found super interesting my first like big druid deck that i got uh golden druid with was the astral communion druid back when that was in standard um but now with stuff like ultimate infestation and branching path for draw and you run double nourish, so you can normally use one for mana, one for draw. You finally, like, don't feel so punished for ramping up early. Which is good, but there's too much of it right now. We're at a critical mass of card draw and armor gain, so Druid is not um, really healthy for the metagame right now. I would say that it's definitely overtuned. Um, but so against aggro, you have tons of armor spreading plague stuff like that and then for control matchups you have multiple successful combos so you have maligos with floop which you can like lower their health with alexstrasza you have the togwoggle azelina mill combo um you have mechathune druid which is not just a meme deck that's actually like a standard viable tournament viable list now so um druid's the definitive king in the meta right now in my opinion um as it goes for aggro decks um, many like aggro style decks in this meta are actually slower than aggro decks of the past. Um, they go for a lot more early board control than older lists used to. So like a lot of the time in past metas, people would say that the best zoo deck was zoo warlock or best aggro deck was zoo warlock. But as like the deck has progressed through all the metas, zoo has really become known as more of a mid rangey deck. Even though it has like a much lower curve and um, the older lists ran like Doom Guard, Soulfire, stuff like that. Um, not this current incarnation, because right now we have Heal Zoo, which is a very, um, a much more aggro centric deck. But um, a lot of aggro decks have typically turned into just a faster mid range style. 
because Odd Paladin is able to get card advantage in aggro mirrors because they get the infinite value from their hero power. And so in aggro mirrors, a lot of the time, like those aggro mirrors will go into like turn 10, 15, if it's like somewhat even, just because um, there's not as many cards that benefit from strictly putting on pressure to the opponent's face. It's a lot more about maintaining board control and getting like a snowballing effect that way. Um, so stuff like that, especially with like Odd Paladin with the tokens and then Rogue, they can use their hero power in the early game to control the board while its minions can still push pressure. Um, but all of this is trading resources other than cards. So you're trading, you know, the tokens that you get from your hero power. So you have infinite like value there. Um, you're using your health for Rogue, which like obviously has always been a like slight thing in Rogue because if you had a normal dagger and you're at like two health, you're obviously never going to be trading with that. But it's become really like an important, impactful part of the Rogue matchups now. Um, all this trading of other resources other than cards sets this aggro metagame apart from some aggro metagames of the past. Because in the past, there was much more of a reliance on just large stats, stats, which is why decks like Zoo and then Tempo Keliseth Rogue were so popular for so long. And then obviously Keliseth is still um, incredibly powerful, but with the introduce, introduction of Baku and Gen, he is used, like he's phased out a decent amount, because obviously Baku decks can't run him, and if you're playing a Gen deck and your only two drop is Keliseth, then you're not really um, putting yourself in a good position there. So, obviously, strong sets are still impactful, but lots of these aggro mirrors can come down to really value, like, valuing your cards and trying to outvalue your opponent through resources, which in the past were less, like, impactful. So, HP, token manipulation, card uh, advantage in aggro matchups. And then, in more of the mid range decks, so like mid range hunter, um, you're using cards which typically seem pretty low impact, but because of some of the cards surrounding them are really good in the early game to help you combat some of these aggro decks that don't just go face. Because we actually don't have like a face hunter anymore, like an undertaker hunter anymore. We have decks which try to build the board, and then once they realize the board is kind of foregone, then they try to hit you in face with everything. So that's why mid range hunter is really good, because you play play dead, which it turns out if you play dead an egg and get a 5 5, or you terror scale and get 8 8 worth of stats on like turn 3 or 4, um, at that point you put too much pressure on the board for the aggro decks to be able to um, really combat. And so then that's when they start actually going face. And so that's one of the reasons why Defender of Argus was put into that mid range hunter list that we saw, because once you're able to make that push with stats onto the board, a lot of aggro decks will just try and do like get you over the top, but that defender really helps you, you know, keep the game fair and minion based. Um, with that, the only typical aggro deck that really exists at this point is Murloc Mage, because um, they typically like turn one, turn two. Sure, they'll do some trading to try and keep their Murlocs alive, but once they get a War Leader down or they get a Mega Sword down there's very little reason for them to do anything but hit your face, especially considering they run Frostbolt, Fireball, Burst, and Alunith. Um, they are really like the face deck right now. Odd Hunter has uh, come in, come out of like obscurity. It's really not particularly good, which is something to say about, you know, how aggro decks function now. It's not enough to just hit face every turn, even with three damage a turn. Like obviously when, when it comes out of the blue occasionally, it can get you, but um, a deck like that will never become the best aggro deck while um, Odd Paladin, Odd Rogue, stuff like that still exists. Um, which is pretty interesting to think about since a lot of the time, like lots of people will just look at aggro or tempo or like faster mid-range decks and kind of just all put them into the same category of like, oh, well, it's brain dead, you just hit face. And obviously, like, sometimes if you're playing hard control and you get a little tilted, it's easy to say, hey, don't have as many decisions. But um, there's definitely things that are very impactful that you can do with your aggro decks, especially now that they've slowed down a bit and become more of a, like, out value um, generation sort of matchup. Overall, the game feels like it's in a really weird place right now going into Rusticons. 
because many matchups are kind of polarized. There was a big talk on the subreddit and a really big article, I think about a month ago, by the Vicious Syndicate that was all about polarization. Um, and right now, if you play a lot of ladder, like some matchups can feel really rock, paper, scissorsy. So like we talked about Odd Warrior, um, it's, a, it's a fringe deck, but it's still a good example of this. It has like a 20% win rate versus Shutterwalk Shaman, Asmodei Priest, Combo Druid, stuff like that. It has no way to beat those. Um, but it, it maintains like a 70% win rate versus any aggro deck. And so the fact that such a deck that is so polarized, where it literally like, it cannot win versus certain decks, like actually cannot, or um, it just crushes you, having that be a deck that people actively play on the ladder is not good for the metagame so luckily it is still sort of fringe but it's it's still like fairly popular it pops up on tier lists it's there's people that hit legend with that and the fact that that can exist is not super healthy um it kind of makes sense that stuff like this is happening though because currently we're with the release of rasticons our standard rotation is going to have the most cards it's ever had um so we're really playing with like the best of the best cards from the past two years. So the meta is always going to become somewhat stale, and there's going to be less room for decks to break through, especially like you know two, three months after cards are released, where you're kind of just in that period of. It's typically used for refinement of decks, and we've seen that. There's lots of different. If you go back and look at the first odd rogue lists versus the one you had to deal with giggling lists versus the post giggling adventure lists, there's obviously things that have changed, but um. The same, the same like semblance of the deck is still there, and you know that makes a lot of sense considering we have so many cards, but so many of them aren't as powerful as the best of the best. Um, even with this, the Boomsday meta has birthed many archetypes. So there's been the creation, the Townfall, and then the resurgence of even Paladin because of its initial card called Arms versions, and then that disappearing, and then now the new versions coming up, which are more grindy. Um, Quest Rogue has come, gone, and then kind of come back. Um, Asmodei Priest is a deck that never existed before. Uh, Xerix Cloning Gallery before Asmodei Priest was thought of as a complete meme card. So it's interesting to see that that was able to be birthed out of this metagame. Um, Death Rattle Hunter became a real deck. It was obviously already in Witchwood, but um, for whatever reason, the meta changed and it got stronger going into Boomsday. So it was already strong, but these last two metagames have been fairly similar, so it's kind of okay to bunch those together, in my opinion. Um, it's been a real real wild ride through the Boomsday, and while I'm looking forward to new cards and new decks, uh, the meta as a whole was actually really fun to analyze. It's been really cool to play against in tournament environments, because since you know a lot of what is strong and some of what the like more pocket picks are, um, there's not a lot currently that's like hiding in the shadows of the Boomsday metagame. A lot of stuff has been experimented with, a lot of stuff has been seen to either be good or decent or completely fail, and that's really good as a community that we're able to, you know, at the end of a metagame, have a very um, kind of standard list of decks that are good, because that means that in tournaments there's a lot more decision making, it's a lot harder for you to be like caught by surprise by something weird. Um, and so I felt that the tournaments that I played in during this metagame were very, like, very analytical. And obviously, like, sometimes you ran into matchups that, you know, you had, like, 30% win rate, 40-60. Um, but those are the best kinds of, you know, metas, where everything at least has a chance. On ladder, it's a little bit different. I feel like it's more rock, paper, scissors but tournament meta, this expansion was a lot of fun. Um, so I think that the only thing going into Rust Cons is, like, We'll get new cards, that's cool. It'll hopefully make new archetypes. Um, with Baku and Gen in rotation for the next like two years, they have to be very wary of what they put at even and odd mana costs. <laughs> so hopefully they don't, like, obviously Odd Rogue, Odd Paladin are really strong right now, so hopefully they don't get too much support going into Rastakhan's. Um, but I think that with new cards, the polarity issue will probably get a little bit better and especially once rotation hits rotation is going to be massive for this block of cards 
because getting rid of Knights of the Frozen Throne with all the Death Knights is going to like really shape a lot of different classes because it means that Hunter has to go in a completely new direction. It probably has to get more aggressive unless the big beast hunter that they're trying to push is good. It means um, Combo Druid loses a key like stalling tool. Um, it's I think that the removal of the Death Knights at one standard rotates is going to really impact. But hopefully Rusticons, you know, hits us really hard with some new stuff. And um, that's really all there is to say about it. I'm really looking forward to Rusticons, and so hopefully it'll help, you know, impact the meta. The expansions, even if they always look, even if you feel like they look lackluster, they always make a giant hit. So I'm very interested to see what happens in Rusticons. And this was a good look back at kind of what made Boomsday what it was. So hope you guys liked watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.